Welcome, everybody. I am joined by Scott Church from Category One Games. Scott, you want to say hello? Hey, everybody. How are you doing? Thanks for having so, me on, Matt. Yeah, absolutely. This is a conversation I think we've been trying to organize for a while. So <laughs> we're going to talk dead card games. We're going to talk about getting Category One started. We're going to talk about kind of everything under the sun. Um, but I, I want to first say that I think Scott you are living the dork's dream. You, you run your own card store. I think, you know, there's this idea like every guy wants to open a bar. It's like, no, I, I want to open up a card store. That's actually been my like childhood dream. So yeah, how did you do it, man? I mean, and tell me a little bit yeah. more about Category 1, like the, the, the origins, what you guys do, you know, where you're at right now, and then we'll get to what you've seen in the last couple of years. Oh, Matt, you know, it's funny because every rapper wants to be an NBA player and every <laughs> NBA player wants to be a rapper. You know, and that's like in the card game world, every player wants to be that store owner and every store owner is like, man, I wish I could just sit down and play card games again. I have to deal with the mail so much. <laughs> I make so many trips to the post office, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, you know, Category 1, uh, it started I, when I was a kid. I was selling baseball cards out of my school locker. Um, my dad took me to Sam's Club. We'd buy sports card boxes. He'd be like, all right, you owe me this much back. You have to sell the packs for this much. <laughs> you know, I'd usually have about six packs left that I'd be able to keep for myself and the rest I was selling off. You know, it's so I kind of started doing this since I was young. You know, that sports cards moved into comic books, moved into trade. You know, when the Star Wars toys came out in the early 90s, episode one, you had like what the Power of the Force, you know, mm -hmm. all those different ones. I was selling those. Um, X-Men toys, you know, I was huge into X-Men comics. I, I used to have a huge comic collection, about 200 long boxes. Um, I scaled that down to about 20 now, I think. I'm but like, like nervous about how door, like the, the comic book stuff. I, I feel like I can't open the Pandora's box there because it'll like suck me in and I'll be like, oh crap. Yeah. I now have a room that, that I can't enter because I'm nervous about knocking a box over. That's Stay away. <laughs> don't don't get into it if you're not. I mean, it's like, hey, don't add heroin to your mix of like drug addictions. You know, like I, I already have. I would say on every single surface on my in my house, there is some sort of card sleeve. Right? It's just like a small stack of Star Wars or Lord of the Rings card that have yep. like a couple sleeves somewhere. Sleeves yeah. are just everywhere, and like my wife is fine. I'm like, what's this one? I'm like, oh, that's uh, uh more stuff. So I, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what came in the mail today? You're you're getting a PO box to like hide it so it's not coming home. You know, no, like I, I sometimes like I hear the door, but I'm like I kind of rush out there to make sure she doesn't see like how big the boxes are. That's right. right. <laughs> uh, but you know, I I think that that's one of the fun things about being a collector is the collecting, and and so that's sort of the first category I put myself in is I you know I'm I'm first and foremost a collector or a hoarder as my you know others would say, but. That, that dopamine hit of the mail day, right? And so right. I will say that I am thankful for places like Category 1, which have <laughs> had this addiction in the past. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, man. So, you know, I was in high school when Reflections 1 came out for Star Wars. Um, and I opened a ton of it, and I was starting to get just accumulation of cards. I remember being in my sophomore class of high school where my, the guy sitting next to me was telling me how he just started trading on the web and he was ripping people off because he would say, I'll send this, you'll send this. And then he would never send his part. And I was like, man, you're a yeah. jerk. Like, don't, <laughs> yeah. don't, what are you doing? But then I was like, oh, you can sell stuff online. Like, how do you protect yourself? So I found eBay in April of 98. Um, I was a junior in high school uh, near the end of my junior year. And so I started selling on eBay. And that's back when you listed it without pictures because you'd have to have a server you uploaded the photo to. You'd have to wait for a check or a cashier's check to come in the mail from the person that won. You'd have to wait a week or two for it to clear, and then you'd send out the item. So basically, it was almost a month-long process from your initial bid buy to when you receive the items. So it was a really interesting time for that. So can I tell you my first eBay username? This is like 98. I had to like borrow my credit, my parents. You know, so I don't even remember how I did it, right? But like yeah, yeah. my first eBay name, because I thought Seekers were such like crap cards, was Card Seeker. Oh, <laughs> nice. <laughs> At least that like fits. Like, hey, you're looking for cards, you know? Like, <laughs> and I was like, oh, it's like a play on like how bad Seekers are in Star Wars, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. So that about 2000, I, I totally got out of the industry. I was like, I want to focus on college and just not do anything with card games. So about 2003, um, 
I got married somewhere around there. And uh, my wife got an internship working at night, uh, two nights a week. And so I was like, well, I'll, I'll go by the local car, uh, card shop here in college and uh, by my, in my college town. And so I started going to it and they're playing Lord of the Rings. And I, I started out with Lord of the Rings. I, I played like Minds of Moria, but th this was about set six. So I started playing set six um, and that was going really well. My computer's saying it's low on power. Hold on one second. Sorry about that. Yeah, yeah sure, sure. I thought I'll, it was. I'll just, I'll just tell jokes. So I can riff. You know. I thought it was plugged in. <laughs> don't don't want to lose you here, and then, then it's just yeah. No one wants you. Oh man, here. yeah. So <laughs> set six had just come out, and uh, so I was playing that of Lord of the Rings. Hero Clicks was popular, and uh, so I kind of got into Hero Clicks a little bit. This is about when Ultimates was out for Hero Clicks. Um, and Raw Deal was big at this store. And it was a blast. We had this great play group where we would have tournaments. A guy basically was like a dungeon master where he'd come up and be like, all right, these guys had the belts. You're coming in and you're going to have matches against this guy's people. And he'd announce it like it was a big deal. We'd have like winner loses a store or loser loses win, uh, that loser leaves the store matches so you'd have to leave the rest of the night <laughs> we'd have you know like take shots of like terrible ginger ale or you know something like type of matches eggnog you know it was like really a fun time with this store for wwe raw deal so we had a good time with that and so i was i was getting back into these games and i was like uh, why don't i i i started buying a ton of raw deal so i started selling all my extras on ebay again i was selling star wars ccg on ebay um during that time, my parents got divorced, so I moved all my stuff from my home in Tennessee out to Utah. So I had all these card and card games that I had kind of abandoned, and I was like, what am I going to do with these? So I started selling them on eBay, and uh, Michael Barr, who owns Desert Sky Games, he's he's known as Law Talking Guy on the PC boards. Mm -hmm. He, he uh, used to be, he used to do, a, he did a design, I think it was for like set nine of the original virtual cards or set ten. Anyways, he owns uh, Desert Sky Games in, in Arizona, and he was in law school, and he had an eBay store called um, Outer Rim Trading Company, and it just had, okay. like, the Outer Rim icon. It was really cool looking. Yeah. And so he contacted me, and he's like, hey, I'm about to graduate law school. Why don't you kind of move into this store on eBay phase like I'm in where you're selling singles for the game? And I'm like, oh, okay. So he kind of tutored me a lot of the way – into selling on the, eBay. The game was out of print at this point, right? This is like 2000. So the, the game's out of print 2001. So yeah, this, is... this is about 2004, 2005. And okay. I mean, okay. boxes back then were dirt cheap. I mean, I was getting Reflections 1 boxes for $10. You know, <laughs> Reflections 2 was like 30. You know, sets of Theed Palace were 40. Uh, I think they're 25 to start. Then they moved to 40 and then eventually 70. And then like once... Um, there's one store that had just a large supply of them. And once they ran out at 70, it's like the palace jumped in price. Coruscant, you know, was like 60 a set at first, you know, I mean, just crazy numbers when you look back on it, you know, uh, Emperor Luke. Oh, reflections too. So I was, I found a former decipher employee that had fresh cut trays of reflections too, that he sold me sets for $40 a set. He had 14 of them. Fo foil sets? foil sets that is Four, <laughs> 14 foil sets of 40 dollars a set so i i sold them in the community for 70 and it took a while to sell out of those and i was like guys this is like two you know four ultra rares you know so it's funny to see these numbers today because i'm like i was i was getting this for 40 dollars and selling it for 70 anyways like it was really crazy times in the early 2000s so I, I talked to Neil, who owned decktech.net, which used to be the Star Wars place to post decks and share community and different things before the PC boards kind of took over for that. And now it's, you know, then it was Facebook and, you know, it's kind of splintered now where the different groups are at to a certain degree. So um, Neil was like, hey, you should get a website. I know a guy that owns Category 1 Games. He started it. He was a school teacher in the summers. You should look at buying it from him. So I, I contacted him and I bought the site from him. He had started it, but didn't really know what to do with it. He had Star Wars, Verse, and Full Metal Alchemist on it. So I'm like, well, this fits with what I'm selling. I don't know Full Metal Alchemist, but I know these other two games. I was playing them and I still collected them. So I, I bought that from him. So, you know, 2006, I kind of bought Category 1 games. and I moved my eBay operation to it. I then, 
continue to do eBay as well. But that became my main focus. And, um, you know, for I was on the wrong platform for a long time uh, where I couldn't really expand and grow. Websites weren't that great back then. And so yeah. <laughs> it, it wasn't it until it merged with like Shopify and everything is now, right? It was like yeah. very funky. You had to set up like your PayPal. You know, yeah. We kept getting hacked. And so that was a big problem <laughs> where like I'd be down for three days because somebody had hacked the site. And I'm like, how are they hacking this? You know, like I, I'm not a web designer. Uh, my degrees in marketing advertising so I, uh, that was more my mindset and i i had always done this on the side and i i went back to school and got a teaching license and i taught middle school high school some college a little bit and teaching's nice because you could do a business like this on the side because you had summers off and you could grow it and do more during that time so I, it was always a side business and uh, i left uh, i I grew the site 2011. I moved over to the cur current website company I'm with now, which let me expand it exponentially. And it was like actually built for card games. So um, this has let me grow and grow. So starting about 2011, 2012, we've just grown year over year with what we're doing. And I grew the Star Wars base. Uh, we started with only five games on the site and we've grown it to now we have over 100. But in 20, 2016, um, I started talking to the Star Wars Players Committee about buying my Star Wars stuff. Um, and they bought that in June of 2016. I signed a five-year non-compete. So I kind of got out of that industry for five years. And I was at a, a, pace, or a space where I was teaching, but I was making more money selling cards. So I was like, maybe I'm going to quit teaching and do this full time. <laughs> but then the Players Committee was like, we'll buy off your biggest category. I'm like, okay. And then... I had an accounting firm that I was talking to that was like, we want to bring you on and you're going to do auditing and you'll basically have two to three months of travel in the fall and spring. And the rest of the year, you're basically off um, because you're not doing the auditing and you're just doing a little bit of cleanup work at home. So I was like, Oh, that'll be nice to actually grow the business there too. So I was kind of at a crossroads of like, do I just do this full time? Do I work this anyway? So the accounting job, I took it and I continued to do category one. And I realized I, after I lost or after I sold off the Star Wars group, I was like, do I keep growing the business? What do I do? Because when it's a side business, there's only so much growth you can do before you have to do it full time. So I was like, what what do I do with this? So I kind of was like, maybe I'll get in and sell magic. So I tried to sell magic. This is when like Almond Cat came out, Modern Masters uh, 2, I want to say. It was like 17, 18, right? That's right. That's right. And I mean, it was kind of like those when you're doing that without a brick and mortar store, it's really hard to do magic because brick and mortar stores get a big discount on magic cards. When you're just doing it online, you're having to buy them secondhand or you have to be working with a store where you're getting it to sell to get that discount. Because if you're not getting that discount, selling singles is just a losing game um, mm -hmm. with that. So I was like, why am I why am I focusing on a current game so much when I can you know, I know these older games. Why don't I just focus more on that? So uh, 2018, I'd say I, I shifted complete focus. It was like, we're just going to add every old game we can, we have any inventory for. And I'm going to just be buying. So I, I contact a ton of stores, uh, you know, brick and mortar stores and say, what's in your back room? Send me your stuff. I'll pay you for it. So I was buying stuff. But 2019, I started to see this shift in older games gaining a lot more uh just interest. And mm -hmm. so I was like, Oh man, this is awesome. Um, we started selling, um, verse system, WWE raw deal. Some of these games that I love playing. And so like, it was fun to like see them being sold on our site and doing really well. And I was like, all right, I've got star Wars coming back in 2022. Where can we build this to when that comes back? So then all of a sudden 2020 started the year, January, February, our, our sales were the best we'd ever had. Uh, for two months. And I was like, this, so this is great. Pre-COVID, right? This is 2020. Because I think, you know, yeah. everybody in the collectibles world wants to attribute collectibles spiking to COVID, right? That, you oh. know, that's the correlation. And, you know, and I've bought that argument a little bit as well, where everybody was bored at home and got to clean up. But you're saying that even before COVID hit, you were seeing an increase January, February, mm -hmm. right? This is the best months. Interesting. About, about August, September 2019 is when it really started. And mm -hmm. then January, February 2020, and then March of 2020, when everybody started going, staying home, it jumped even more. So I think we we're already like on an upward tra trajectory, but then it just, you know, COVID ramped it up and put it on crack basically. Like it just, 
sped up that increase in interest. But I think we were already heading there, you know, so I think this would have been like a, a gradual incline and we would have gotten to this point, but you know, this definitely increased it. So um, yeah, Matt, you got, it yeah, like yeah, you no, I, I mean, it's, it's just, uh, it's really interesting to, to, to hear that perspective. I, and I think, uh, one thing I've had to say, by, by the way, Scott also has a channel. You, sh you guys should like and subscribe. You should like and subscribe my channel. I've had to do that. I always forget to do that thing, you know, the plug, the shameless plug. Um, but, you, you know, I, I think that we're experiencing sort of one of these 20 year nostalgia super cycles. And, you know, Star Wars hit, you know, you kind of had the Decipher IP that was lost in 2001. You had same thing with Star Trek, I think is accelerating. Don't talk a lot about Star Trek, but. You know, I think a lot of these games, there's an immense nostalgia cycle for Decipher as a company. <laughs> and, right. you know, I also just only experience a small slice of the TCG and CCG world. But it seems to me right now that Decipher properties are just like as hot as they've been in 20 years. And oh, yeah, um, it's really interesting also to have this conversation on the cusp of, you know, economic slowing. I don't want to say the recession word, but, you know, people are tightening their belts a little bit. And what does that mean? And I'd be curious on your take. You know, people are maybe making less, you know, uh, a little like tighter financial decisions. They have less disposable income. You know, what do you kind of think that means for some of these dead games that people might have been indulging over COVID? Are they, you know, going to flood the market with it? Or what's your perspective there? Yeah, great questions. So I'll, uh, what's really interesting, I, I follow a lot of stores. So like, uh, like I mentioned, Desert Sky Games, Michael Barr has a blog where he talks about small business retail. Gary Ray owns, um, oh, oh gosh, why can't I think of the name of it? It's uh, uh, it's in California. He owns a store and he's written a book called Friendly Neighborhood Game Store. And it's really good. But these guys have, have blogged for years. And one thing they found is Gary went through the recession in 20, 2008 um, to you know 2012, ish 2006, wherever you want to start where the recession mm -hmm. started. He went through that with a store and he said, we actually did really well. And if you talk to game store owners that own stores during that time, game stores actually did well during the recession. And it's because people still want to find joy and happiness and they can do that in small purchases. Whereas it's the big things like the hot tubs, the, you know, side by sides, the vacations, air, you know, Airbnb is like watching this economy right now and being like, oh, crud, you know, gas prices are up. You know, are people going to be traveling to stay at, you know, resorts? Like, So, you know, it's funny you mention that because I experienced a similar thing. So growing up, my parents, we grew up in a, a tourist town like that's big for the state of Michigan. Sure. Um, and they, they had a small business. And during the recession, it actually did quite well because people weren't canceling their like intra-Michigan trips. Right. They, yes. they were still wanted to get away for a weekend, but yep. they were canceling their week long Florida trip. Right. But yeah. The, get away with the kids for two days. They still wanted to have that fun. So it was really fascinating to kind of watch like this town that ran on tourism do absolutely fine during the recession because people were still getting away for the weekend. Right. They didn't get away for the week, you know, et cetera. So I think your comment on, you know, like I think magic sees a big influx, you know, when the market goes well, like we kind of used to joke as Bitcoin went up, the market goes up for collectible <laughs> garbage, right? So it, it was kind of like funny how that worked. And, and uh, so Magic sees that a lot more than like kind of the niche or smaller games do because Magic's much more of a um, collector's market for the big car name cards. And they're following that much more closely. You know, what's on the reserved list? What's on, you know, this list? You know, Star Wars, it's like, hey, we're just not going to buy that high end, you know, loot graded 10 right now, but we're still going to buy the cards we need to build a deck. Mm -hmm. You know, and so I think we we're not seeing that and we won't see it as much. The other thing too is I'll point out. So like, this is a uh, original Michael Jordan uh, set of shoes that my dad had. Uh, my yeah. son, my son's got into shoe flipping. And I mean, this is huge amongst the teenage audience. He's 15, all of his friends in it. Nike does these drops where you have to be on the app and you want to get the drop as the shoes. The come gamification out. of shoes is just like a marketing oh, coup de top, right? In my opinion. Beautiful. I mean, whoever came up with this is doing a great job. You know, you see that <laughs> even going into the swimsuit line, uh, which, which, uh, Kylie Jenner, one of the yeah, Kardashians, well, no, it's a uh, Bella Hadid or one of those sisters is doing that now with a swimsuit line where they're doing drops with that, you know, and it's like these people that are gamification, things to you know almost create a collectible buzz 
is great for business. So like my son buys and sells shoes all the time now and he's 15 and he he buys them he sells them to his friends they sell them to each other he, uh, there's uh dr- what is it drop x shop some like shoe Stock, easy to stock sell. x is stock like x. a big which actually i will note that stock x is also getting into collectibles which oh, is an interesting. interesting trend yeah uh, right now it's mostly pokemon but they do like some comic books so i think that that's sort of a bigger macro trend that maybe not for the dead stuff but yeah you might start to see them getting into like magic and like what that means as you have like a broader platform and You know, the folks at TCG are a little nervous. But the interesting (laughs) thing about Magic is I do think because it's such a broad audience, it tracks more with these sort of like macroeconomic trends because people, you know, it's just the exposure to the population is much higher. Whereas I think Star Wars, there are so many what I call black hole collectors. My my good friend Andy Talaga is one of them, right? Like he he buys a card and he's going to put it away. And I am also one of these people. I have plenty of cards. I'm just, I'm never going to sell this. Uh, you know, I, I have expressed instructions to my wife when I die to, to contact the following five people to yeah. make sure that these don't end up as a Facebook post of what do I have here? And like, the, you know, the sharks come circling in. Uh, and, and I mean, all, all this stuff we collect, I mean, like, you know, it's cheaper. I've been buying old, you know, Transformers Generation 1 toys, which is actually cheaper to buy these than it is the current line of Transformer toys for the most part. And so it's it's really interesting where it's like I can enjoy things from my childhood for a cheaper price than what I can buy new things for. So, I mean, you can get into these older card games and enjoy them more than you would trying to keep up with magic trends in the current market. So that's what actually helps, you know, these older card games hold value. And like you're talking about, like, when you die, you know, here's what to do with my cards. I've had this discussion with my wife. Like, what do you do with the business if I die? Right. Like, it's really interesting. But like look at i i love watching what's happening with uh train collectors uh you know fine china uh stamps um elvis collectibles those markets have completely tanked because the original collectors are dying off and their kids don't want anything to do with it so they're just selling it dirt cheap to get rid of it mm. and so like uh, you know, eventually all this stuff we're into will probably hit that point where it'll eventually go to like our kids or, you know, our spouses or, you know, whoever receives it and is like, I don't know what to do with this. So then <laughs> it's just going to be dumped. Right. So yeah. it's, it's, it's a really interesting thing. So it's like this stuff has, there's a popularity. You enjoy the things when you're kind of a teenager, they, they bring you nostalgic feelings. So you get into it again when you're thirties, forties, when you have more expendable income, you enjoy having it on your shelf for those like fifties, sixties. And then like, what happens to it so i mean we're in a great phase for that right now and all these you know hobby gaming video games all this stuff market and it'll be that way for a while now you know but i'm kind of i love watching the long game you know like watching what's happening with elvis collectibles no one wants elvis stuff maybe this new movie will help but like it's pretty I interesting not imagine me ever buying an elvis collectible or or being told <laughs> that like this thing is worth you know thousands of dollars. I would just be like laugh. Same thing with stamps. Like yeah. just that, that feels like the like the OG collectible, right? And it just right. feels like so like anachronistic when you stop and think about it. So I mean, what's really fascinating, you know, we're not only seeing this in the collectibles market, but like vintage clothing is huge right now. So like, there's uh, down. I was visiting family in Gilbert, Arizona recently, and it was like three high school friends that started a retail store where they would go to all the thrift shops, buy vintage clothes, and then just sell it for $70, $80 a shirt. You know, and they were probably paying two, three, five bucks for it from a vintage store originally, or like a, you know, thrift store. And, you know, they're selling it for like $70, $80, and they're just getting a ton of business. This younger generation is finding new ways to to bring stuff back and, and make things collectible that I would never expect. Like my, my daughter, who's 13, loves vintage clothes now. We when we go to towns or new places, she always wants to go vintage clothes shopping. I mean, there's it's a huge it's really interesting to see where the collectibles market is going in so many different facets. And there's so many different ways to do it now. Yeah. And and like, what is a collectible now? I mean, there's like things I would say two years ago, I helped my parents purge their VHS collection by purging. I mean, we just tossed it. Right. Like we're talking like three to four hundred VHSs. And I'm like. Did I make a fatal error? <laughs> what I literally yeah. just throw away like Dumbo they were in, in the, the VHS because I don't know. Yeah. Um, but well, I that's, could, that's, an interest, that's an interesting market too because like there's so many movies that uh, I was listening to um, 
Bill Simmons and the Ringer has a, a show called Rewatchables, mm -hmm. and they rewatch a movie and they talk about it. Well, they've been talking about a few of these shows that you can't find digitally anymore. Mm -hmm. So they're like, oh, this this was a really good movie, but it's no longer anywhere digitally. So those DVDs and VHS of anything like that become extremely collectible all of a sudden. When it's removed from the public ability to buy it easily, it, that it, it suddenly gains value. You saw that with... Um, what was it ducktales remastered for like xbox 360 and playstation 4 because they lost the license to having ducktales you know for a video game and all of a sudden that you know finding the physical copy was they all shot up in price because you couldn't buy it digitally anymore anyways it's so it's so cool man i love all this stuff i, I love the whole this is what like the heart of being a collector i was, I was <laughs> chatting with someone else about this and like everything's too expensive now but i was yeah. like but if it was cheap would you want it right like if, if a master set of Star Wars CCG, like the reason that Reflections One boxes were, were ten dollars in whatever two thousand five, is because nobody wanted it, and, and nobody wanted it because it was cheap. And, and I've been like puzzling this out a lot, where I'm like, hold on, do I only want this because it's expensive? And does that make me a dupe? Like, am I a, yeah, like a yeah. fool? Because I'm like, this, oh, this Darth Maul AI is is nice, and I perceive it being nice because it's valuable, and therefore yeah. it's like a perpetuating cycle. So. You know, going back to cards a little bit, what is the one CCG, let's say dead CCG, that you're kind of like, everybody's sleeping on this one? That's not so, Star Wars. I feel like Star Wars is, you know, no, I, I don't think anyone's sleeping on it. I actually think it's a pretty well, you know, talked about market. Yeah, I mean, I mean Star Wars was beat Magic for a few times when Magic was struggling to figure out what they're going to do with their blocks and rotation and whatnot. I will just, like, say that it, it it astounds me that Magic the Gathering, which I remember being, like, 13 and being like, this thing that has this, like, very 90s-looking card back, like, this is the winner. <laughs> like, this is the one that's still played in 2022. Right. And not, like, many of these other TCGs. That, that were very popular and like better produced or like, I, I don't know. It's just so strange to me that like magic won. I'll just say that <laughs> someone who encountered it in like 2000 or 1996, right? 1997. They just released their what double masters uh, two set. I almost made the mistake of buying a box. I didn't. Okay. I almost the, made that mistake. I've talked to a few different retail stores, brick and mortar stores, and they've said this is like, it was their biggest sales day on that release by two to three times any other previous amount. That that set just drove so much interest. Anyways, so, I mean, you're talking about, like, uh, games that are kind of flying under the radar. You know, the biggest one, it has to be something that had a following. Uh, here's here's where I see games that still have interest going. Sure. It had a, a big following at the time. It had a play, you know, like someone organized play. That's what I'm looking for. Organized play. It has a continual organized play, like a players committee or somebody that stepped up and either has, you know, still physical releases of new cards or they're doing virtual, uh, you know, releases or they're doing um, like the, the ability to play online, like with with Jemp or, you know, Cardnum for Middle Earth or, you know, WWE Raw deal has a way to play. Anyways, uh, you know, you can play both Lord of the Rings and Star Wars with with Gemp, Jemp, Gemp. I already said I say Gemp. I, 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 anyway, talk to a guy who dope design. He's like, it's Gemp. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's Mike, Mike Gem, and you know, it's spelled almost like the same way. So we always said it's it's gotta be Gemp, right? Like, anyways. So yeah, so you got Gemp, but so those are kind of like some of the important things. But you also the games that have a license have so much more interest uh, outside of just players. So, like, for example, Legend of the Five Rings had a huge amount of sets, had a lot of players. But there's just not a lot of interest from like people coming back into it wanting to play besides those that played it. There's such a huge like Decipher has said that 80% of their buyers were collectors, that they just, you know, they're buying like a trading card set, basically buying their stuff. Uh, it wasn't even to play it. So to me, like I look at, you know, you've already got Star Trek and Star Wars being big, big things, but Lord of the Rings, I mean, you've you've kind of talked about that and and led to that. Lord of the Rings is gonna explode. Lord of the Rings went through a huge dead period from 2006 to 2018. I would get collections offered to me every week. I had a box of rares that I just had at a quarter that I'd sell to local players. And I mean, these were like top of the end rares, you know, like, uh, like double shots, you know, different things like that. Where like, I just, yeah, yeah. I had so much of it coming in that I was turning people away from buying collections. I'm like, look, like it's just going to sit here and, Lord of the Rings has just exploded. The foil market for it is hot. People want those, you know, rings foiled. They want the main characters foiled. 
And we're about to hit a period where those actors are going to start showing up more at conventions to get cards signed. And that whole signature audience is huge and they're into it and they love it. So Lord of the Rings, I think in value is just going to skyrocket here. And Decipher did it right with that game where there's common versions of the cards, you know, main character cards, and there's rare versions and they have different utilities for different deck styles. You know, whereas like I look at the original Star Wars, I'm like, you can only get one Darth Vader up until special edition. And then you have the two player one that doesn't count. But like, that made that first Vader so collectible. I feel like Star Wars CCG, which is a game I love, right? It is the game I love, but it is like just a crash course in all the mistakes of <laughs> 90s card making, right? Yeah. Like the double oh, back man. sides is so short-sighted, right? I mean, not only does it make it so hard to like, you know, break in and, and start playing the game because you need to have 120 car different car, you know, cards yeah. to each side. But it also makes it like different for sorting. It makes it more difficult, like down the road when you have like heaven forbid, like the trade federation, which aren't imperials, right? Like yeah. branding, and, and it just is like a, a big mess, right? Oh, like, man. I was thinking about this all the day, like driving in the car. I was, I was like, man, you know, think about it. Like, I could, I, I played competitive Magic as a teenager, like fifth edition time, man. I was playing competitive events. I was winning boxes at stores. You know, I was winning these tournaments. And it was like I had to prep for about five different decks playing against Magic because there's only about five decks that were big decks to play against, yeah. you know, in type two at the time. And so I only had to prep for five. In Star Wars, you had five <laughs> light side and five dark side. You had to spend more money to have both decks built. You know, with Magic, I only had to have one deck built, really. And so I'm like, from a marketing side, I guess that's good for Decipher because they made you buy double the amount that you needed to play any other game. But anyways, I mean, yeah. I don't like know what you said. It is from a marketing standpoint, though, because I, I mean, I've been like chewing on making a video of like, here's what you, if you own zero cards, what do you do? Right. You want right. you heard because I see this a lot. Right. People are like, I've heard that this is the best Star Wars game ever made. Right. I, I want to get into it. How do I do it? I'm like, well, I wouldn't start with Premiere because Premiere is a mess. Uh, I, I don't know if I would tell you to buy a complete set because you get a lot of junk. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of the other stuff. And, and so I think my conclusion is start with special edition because special edition is what premiere should have been. Yeah. And so like buy a special edition set. That's like my new advice to give to people. And when I do this video, that might be my big conclusion because everything else is kind of a mess, right? Like, but you can play special edition, and have fun, right? Right. With premiere. It's like half the stuff in there is like just garbage. Right. Well, when you talked about the card backs, like, so, what if for episode one they made a different card back for dark side and you you had to show up to a tournament with two, a one dark side deck and then it had to be you know it could be episode one it could be you know tales of the jedi it could be you know legacy where it's which is in the future you know if you if you really expanded the game out you could do like different backs for different eras um, you know, and had their different logo for what the like imperial sign was, or you know, episode seven, eight, nine is that logo for light and dark, you know. Mm -hmm. And so then you show up with like whatever era you're playing with those backs, but yeah, I mean, you could also do that just with the front, too. I mean, it's just yeah, like yeah, so fascinating with like with like wars, which is yeah, you know, later property, like oh yeah, we should have the back be the same. <laughs> yeah. like, that might yeah. have been a mistake from a design standpoint. Uh, we're, we're gonna fix that, yeah, but uh. No, but back to Lord of the Rings, though. Uh, you, you know, I have a lot of love for that game. I, I don't think there's enough on ramps, like easy on ramps right now. I think that you you got to be able to capture this nostalgia. People are excited about it. How do you make this easy for them? And that's one thing, like, you know, category one, I think you guys make it pretty easy, right? Like, there, there's singles for sale. Like, you know, one of my suggestions would be maybe you can have some pre made decks, right? That's just an idea. That's, it's also yeah. how you put those together. But, you know, I think that, like, if you just have these products, like, hey, take these two things and you and a buddy can play this and have a good time, that, that's great. And and so I agree, like, people are sleeping on Lord of the Rings. Um, you're about to hit, like, a 20-year cycle. As you said, the, the, the actors going on signatures. I mean, signatures are another market that I think is really fascinating. And with Star Wars, I think it's, like, poised to go absolutely bonkers because you have all these actors that are dying off. And... You know, there's just David Prost would sign your shoes, right? Like that was always a joke. David Prost would like, he was Darth yeah. Vader, would sign anything. But, you know, since he's passed, he's not there to sign anything anymore, right? So even if there was tons of Darth Vader signed, 
you know, there's a market for this because he's no longer, you know, with us. So I, I think that that's a market I'm, I'm super interested to kind of see where it goes. Um, and, and Lord of the Rings, I'm going to be trying to put out some more videos to try to help people with these on ramps. But uh, I think it's a really great game and also super playable, right? It, it's such a more like modern TCG than than Star Wars, you know, or, or Star Trek, which I tried playing Star Trek once. I was like, I cannot wrap my brain up. What's going on. <laughs> like it's, yeah, yeah. It's like too much. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of excited to see where things go with, with Lord of the Rings. Um, you know, I'm curious, what other kind of broad observations or thoughts do you have kind of, you've been in this longer, you, you kind of mentioned earlier, you know, like I've only been doing this collecting stuff since like 2000. So I'm, I'm like a newbie here. You've so, been here through the dark days. <laughs> let, let me, let me hit on a few points there. I, I think we're really interesting to cover. So like when you used to talk to actors, like Chewbacca, the guy that played Chewbacca came to a, a Star Wars, it was like a comic tournament or a comic event. Um, and then a, a Star Wars tournament was being held there. And you could go up and get free signatures from them. So we all went and got our Chewie sign for free. So signatures used to be cheap. And then David Prowse and a bunch of other guys came, you know, Jeremy Bullock, uh, Ula, and a bunch of different people came and signed at a local event. And it was between 10 to $35 for a signature. I mean, this was back 2010-ish. And now, I mean, to get a signature can be between 50 to $200 on top of just getting money to go to the con that they're going to be at. So, I mean, the whole signature game has really shot up in value. So it's almost like those that had early signatures that were getting them for free, $10, $30. I mean, their cards are worth so much more now because if you're selling that on a secondary market just to get one signed now, either they've passed away or they were charging a lot more before they did pass. I saw the Ian McGregor one because I thought about getting an Obi-Wan signed. I saw it was $220. Yes. Yeah. Like, nope. No, thank you. Well, and what, what's <laughs> yeah. the... What's the thing now where you can pay to get like Natalie Portman signatures and they're like five hundred dollars for a signature? I mean, it's yeah, insane. I think official picks is a website that yeah. does stuff like that. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's it, it's it's wild to me. Uh, but I mean, I guess the other thing is I think that a lot of these actors are sort of like a listers. Like Natalie Portman yeah. is in the new Thor movie, right? Like her right. time <laughs> is valuable, right? Whereas she, like she got all jack, she got jacked from doing all those signatures for right, people for five hundred dollars a pop, right? It's like, man, my biceps got so huge off of those. Yeah, no, absolutely. But yeah, like, like Jeremy Bullock, like, no offense to you know, great actor, but like, yeah. you know, if you can get thirty bucks, that's thirty bucks, <laughs> some some gas money. So let me uh, tell you, with like Lord of the Rings, to where to start? For me, when I got back into Lord of the Rings, I was like, what decks or what style do I like to play? And I liked the idea of uh, Rohan with uh, Moria orcs and so i was like all right what's a deck list for this so like my website category one games has a deck builder it's a it's a top link if you're on the site on a desktop site it'll show like deck builder and you can paste a deck list into it and it'll pull back all the cards that we have of that from your deck list so like for me i found a deck list that i liked i then went and just bought that deck list and then i had a physical copy to play in my hands of all those and mori orcs is cheap for the most part you yeah. know, there's not too many expensive cards in it, and it, it plays really well synergy-wise. And so you you pair that with almost any fellowship, and it's it's a great way to start. And, yeah, I, man, you, you're totally right. I need, like, basic intro decks for a lot of these games. The problem is, like, during the pandemic, we sold out of so much of our kind of bulk stuff that, like, I'm still building back up. And Lord of the Rings, no one's selling collections anymore. Like I said, I used to always get these collections. My... Lord of the Rings section is the smallest it's ever been. And I'm just not getting much in. We we restock a lot through our buy list where people sell into us or trade into us. And I don't get a lot. Maybe like once a month I get Lord of the Rings. And that used to be, you know, eight to ten times a month. So, like I said, Lord of the Rings, I think, is going to explode. Also, you know, you guys were talking about, you know, collect your last video that was out uh, with the four of you talking about uh, collecting Star Wars. Um no one really brought up the shows and what an impact uh, the mm -hmm. current shows have on the market. So Lord of the Rings is about to have this Amazon series release. And there's a lot of like negative hype coming from it from like what nerd tonic or something like they're giving a lot of negative reviews of what's going to happen. I feel negative, negative hype is also just clicks for them. Uh, right? It, it is. It's just I, clickbait. The worst. Like, right. You know, I'm, I'm going to watch it. I'm going to decide if it's good or not. They're spending right. a million dollars on the show. Yeah. Right. So there, there's I, money. I mean, I watched like Wheel of Time and I was not impressed, but I also didn't really enjoy that book. I started on the first book. I didn't really enjoy it, but I love Game of Thrones. And I also love The Witcher, man. I never played any Witcher video games, but that show, I love that show. That guy is like so cool in that. 
<laughs> then I'm like, I'll, I'll just Cavill, It's also like the casting, everything about yeah. the Witcher is, is yeah. great. Like, I agree. And you know, I am so pro, like if you can do the right thing with the IP, like they had the, the Witcher spin off the, uh, the anime, which I thought was a great yeah. movie. Right. You know, and <laughs> like, take this IP, like I'm kind of hopeful that Amazon, they have this writer's Rohan anime, like do stuff yeah. like that that can be complimentary. Um, and, and I, but I will say, and maybe this is controversial, but like, I think the Tolkien fan base is a little bit different and more protective of the IP than maybe, you know, people complain about Disney, but they're also like, Hey, the Mandalorian's great. You know, right. like everybody generally like Kenobi after episode six, right? Like, you know, and, and a big market, I mean, look, market, when marketing people look at research, they look at teenagers, like what middle school is doing. That's where they want to be is marketing to, to middle school um and and to high school so if they can make this series get them interested like for example star wars you know you guys started th that last group you had on started collecting kind of 2020 and beyond from like when episode seven to nine was released they lost a lot of interest from people people weren't buying legos they weren't buying toys those sat on shelves i mean toys r us a big reason i mean obviously they had a lot more reasons to fail but a big reason was star wars was just a dead product for them they spent a lot of money on it was not moving you know, mm -hmm. I, I have kids, my oldest is 15, then I got 13 and 10 year old. The 15 year old doesn't like care for Star Wars at all because it skipped him during his kind of period where he gained interest in it. He kind of likes Mando, but like, that's about it. You know, but my 13 year old and 10 year old, this Mandalorian hit at the right time to really gain their interest. So when they go back and watch shows, they're watching episode one through three. That appeals to them. Four through six is kind of like, yeah, it's there, but it's it's kind of outdated like looking. People. It's yeah, like it's, people are it looks it. outdated. Episodes right. one through three are fun, and it's the story of Darth Vader, and they want Vader. Seven, eight, and nine, it doesn't have Vader. They don't care. So when you know Disney's talking about, hey, we're going to get away from like the Skywalker legacy, and we'll do shows not based around Skywalker, that's your money, man. Your main character is Vader. If you don't have him in it, I mean, there's a reason this Obi-Wan, we we sat through it was because we wanted to see stuff with vader in it more than anything else and his arc and we want more hayden christensen you know my, you ask my 10 year old and 13 year old that's all they care about is like dude that was awesome we're gonna go watch clone wars to see vader you know come in the last few seasons anyways so i i have like a theory that i think uh star wars and maybe this is my hot take is it possible that star wars is better in the animated form like Rebels and Clone War were, are just like so, like Clone Wars is eight pretty good seasons, yeah. right? Like, yeah, I don't know if you've seen it all, but like it, it, it rarely misses, right? It, whereas, yeah. like I would say, seventy five percent of the live action, whether it's Mandal, like they're they're all pretty good, right? But there there's some misses, right? Like even Mandalorian, which is sure I like. There's some episodes where I'm like, okay, they're gonna do a mission, and then they're, they're yeah. gonna. It's like a. It feels like a video game. That's how sometimes yeah. I think he's like talks to like an NPC. The NPCs like gives him a quest, and then yeah. he a quest, yeah. and he you know goes on a journey to find it. But uh, we we digress a little bit. You know, I think I think it's interesting to think about that, and you know whether Lord of the Rings, which I think is a, is a beloved IP by me, can feel a little inaccessible to like that younger generation. Um, so I, I'm, I'm curious to see what this can do. Uh, I mean, the Hobbit movies were, were kind of a mess. I'm just going to throw that out there. Yeah. That was probably the best chance to like engage this sort of like, you know, 12 and under. And instead it's like, you know, these movies were a disaster. In no my opinion. But uh, I mean, that's why they keep rebooting Spider-Man to being younger and younger each time. Right. Because they've got to reach that younger audience. And if they don't hook them young, then they, they don't gain them as a fan for the rest of their life. You know, like the music you enjoyed when you were 12 to 13, 14 is probably the same music you like listening to now. And that's just about with everything. So you've got to really hook that age group. You can, you can tell them in middle school, I taught business in middle school. Man, I would like, I felt like it was like my marketing study test with these kids where I'd like give them surveys about stuff. And it's like, oh yeah, that's how you think. You know, like I love that. Because that's it's what real marketing companies do. That's the age range they really want to target. So, I mean, with, with that, I think that Versus System, you know, I actually just sold off a very small Versus System collection. I think that is one that I would be kind of bullish on, which for folks that aren't aware, Versus System is like a Marvel universe. It's not just Marvel. It's more than Mar that. Marvel, I, I, D is Marvel DC. Yeah, man. It's so I, I think that that's one that's going to poise to maybe see, you know, more, more action, more attention. Hero Clicks is making a bit of a comeback. I mean, it's it has interest because it's figures of these things. 
you know, of these characters they like. And so it's like little miniature figures. It's even not so much for the play, but just to have like, hey, I've got the Storm, the Jubilee, the Rogue, whoever it is, you know. So, um, so, so Scott, I think, I you know, I want to have a conversation with you again in like, let's say three or six months. What do you think is going to be the top thing we're going to be like? We have to talk about this oh, thing. What, what do you think it's going to be? Because <laughs> what is going to be the thing like shaking the market or, you know, that, that we're going to be talking about? Hopefully not the crash of the <laughs> collectibles market. Yeah. Uh, but what, what do you, what's your big prediction maybe for 20, oh, you know, latter half of 2022 or, you know, into 2023? I, you know, I think we're going to continue to see slow increases in Star Wars. Uh, Lord of the Rings will continue to jump. I mean, that's what's hard for stores like mine is how do you price Lord of the Rings right now? Right. Well, like I'll say about Lord of the Rings is like it's kind of ch cheap still. Right. Like and this is like I, I hear sometimes people complaining, kvetching about prices. I'm like, hey, man, most of the rares are a buck. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, I I, uh, I just bought a, a set of Minds of Moria, a complete set for $70. Right. Which is, you know, it, it's not very expensive for a complete set of cards, right? So right. I think that's one of the reasons why, you know, I think about Lord of the Rings is a lot of room to grow. It's because it's still fellowship base set. It's like 150 bucks, right? So it's still pretty cheap for a lot of cards. Right. Yeah. I mean, like you said, verse system, really popular. The group for that is rabid. They, they love the game. They play it. They enjoy it. They, they have a group that's created a lot of uh, kind of proxy or fake cards and, and teams that were never actually made for the game. You know, we're going to see a lot more growth. I think we're going to see much more customization. You know, even for Star Wars CCG, there's obviously the Players Committee, but there's more and more groups popping up on Facebook and such. They're creating their own cards based around, like, this new Obi-Wan series. They're already putting out stuff. I, I follow some of those guys on Twitter, and I, I want to get them on the channel sometimes. So if you guys made it to minute 47, <laughs> you know, yeah. please, please shoot me a DM. But I, I'm a little <laughs> nervous about shaking that tree and getting, yeah. like, this this guy's banned from PC stuff because he he brought on like the the, the leper people. Yeah, uh, I I mean that's that's the scary thing is like, but there's like even for WWE Raw Deal, there's like a Raw Deal Chili group that does proxies for the cards, and they make them with better images than what were originally made. And it's like this is so cool. I want to get this printed just so I can have it from my play. Yeah. You know, and that's a, that's the tough thing even with like this collectibles market. More and more of these cards are you know you can you can make your own and they they look nice like the originals they don't feel exactly like them you know so i, I always wonder what that's going to do to shake things up um and, and i wonder if that will eventually have an impact you know like on on how our prices are and, and when we're buying collections we're having to check for more real cards versus fakes you know it'll be really interesting i think that's that's something to watch for over time and then also like you know, you have these grading companies. They don't have a lot of experience with Star Wars CCG. How do they know what's a real versus a fake for a lot of these when that grader is seeing their third Star Wars CCG card and they've never really dealt with it? Well, the other thing is like, and a lot of these companies have, you know, quintupled their staff in the last two years. Yeah. Like, you just can't tell me that someone that came on in 2021 is the same as like a guy who's been grading cards since 2000, right? Like, right. there's just something to be said about experience. And so... That's one of the question marks. So I, I think I've kind of described myself as like grading curious, right? Like <laughs> I've never sent anything in, but I'm kind of curious and I own a yeah. couple that I bought, you know, secondary markets. Um, I, I'm actually on the hook to send a couple in via one of my videos. So I got to do that. But uh, the quality control and inconsistency, these are things that I, I think are going to be long-term issues for yeah. you know, grading. And so I'm, I'm curious, I saw someone post in one of the Lord of the Rings groups about Lord of the Rings grading is that like the villagers got out their pitchforks and like, how dare you think yeah. about grading? And so right. I, I think that's going to be an interesting conversation. Maybe that's my take into 20, you know, going into the latter half of the year into 2023 is what is the conversation about grading? Um, you know, and, and what does that mean? Like what's the kind of consensus? And also, Will we continue to see new collectors come in? I, I think what I've witnessed uh, over the last two years is just a steady stream of people like me that kind of stumble their way in. And I'm hoping that this channel can kind of be a softer landing a little bit. We at least have resources. Yeah. Um, but I'm wondering if, hey, everyone's back at work. We're all, you know, the telework is dead, <laughs> you know, and people just have their life. If you're going to just see not necessarily people leaving, but just no more new people coming in. Um, so I think that's going to be kind of curious to watch. My prediction is I, I think that we're going to continue to see this steady stream because nostalgia is a really powerful drug. And if you just put the information out there, people will find it and, and you know, 
more the merrier. I'm a big big tent guy, right? Which I think that some of these communities aren't big tents. So that people that you know, like, oh, we, we're only for players, or no, no, we only want to do grading. It's like no, like everybody. This stuff was printed by the hundreds of thousands, right? I think they printed one yep. million Darth Vaders. <laughs> you can have ten thousand graded, and you still have nine hundred ninety thousand for for playing, right? Like, right. we all can be here, guys. I promise. Like, there's enough cards in people's basements for everybody. Well, I think that's really interesting is, you know, how how long will people stay around in it once they've kind of got that nostalgia bug and then get out of it? Um, you know, I I was for a period of time, we weren't getting a lot of buy lists in. And I'd say over the past two to three months, we've had more buy lists come into our store than we've had for the past year um, where either people are needing money. And so they're looking to shift, you know, their resources into actual cash from these cards or they've they collected it during the pandemic and now it's time to move on and they're on to other things so well, that, yeah sorry go ahead yeah so it's really fascinating to me because i i'm curious to see how long this lasts you know and that's one thing with me like we've been adding you know we went from having five ten you know we're adding on more games all the time and i'm doing that because i want to be involved with more communities and more game sites so it protects me as a seller if you know if star wars or star trek crashes tomorrow you know i still have you know i just added gridiron which was like a, a fantasy football game in the 90s not many people are going to be buying that but at least it's there someone's like hey i need five cards to complete my set i've got them now and at least we're pulling in a little bit of income streams from different games you know there's very few of these games that you know I, i'd say there's probably like a big five to seven that actually pull in decent money and there's a big collector group for it and the rest are just kind of like little bits here and there you know someone needs to finish a set and they're spending a few hundred bucks and then you know it doesn't sell again for a few months but so I like, think there's yeah i think it's it's a good perspective i think there's something you said about like having these games all in one place and how complimentary it can be because you look and you're looking for star wars and you notice like oh gridiron i, I have some of those cards right, right? yeah so, like you know all of this feeds in and i think that's where you kind of get the, the synergy and a bit of the momentum with collecting i mean i, I think for me like i i see star wars as uh, pr pretty recession proof because I think that there's just so many collectors that uh, th they just have no incentive to sell. They don't really need the money, you know, unless th they sort of pass away or, or something catastrophic happens. Uh, I think a lot of the people that maybe needed the money uh, for Star Wars, I think, sold in COVID, right? Like yeah. I, I, count, I saw a lot of those posts like, hey, you know, X person got sick. Like something happened during those two chaotic years where, right. you know, a lot of people were sitting at home just, you know, sending emails and other people were absolutely struggling, right? Because there was this huge stratifying event for the U.S. So I think that a lot of the sort of uh, uh, folks that that, that 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 are not as well resourced kind of got like shaken. The tree got sh shaken and they fell out and like, I, you know, I don't want this. But to your point about collectors finishing, I mean, I have a master set and I kind of caught the white whale. And yeah. now I'm like, what do I do? And so I moved yeah. on to white border sets. Okay, I did the white border sets. Okay, then I moved on to oversize. Okay, I got all the oversize. And now, like, I'm at this point where I'm like, what, what is there left to collect? You know, Alexander saw there's no world <laughs> yeah. like, and wept, right? So I, I think for me, like, it's, it's finding community. And, and I think yeah. that hopefully that's the key to all of this for longer term collectors. It's just finding people that like the same stuff as you, like talking about it, like, you know, grading it. And, and really any energy in a dead game is good. That's like my founding sure. thesis of all this is these games are out of print. They don't have meta refreshes, right? That Magic has every two weeks now, right? Like they they yeah. got to like get energy somehow. And if people are excited about a, a 10 Sauron, that's great. I think that's right. cool. I, you know, I have no idea how much it's worth. I have no idea how much I would pay for it, but uh, I think it's cool, right? Yeah. So that's, that's sort of my, my philosophy on all this. Cool. It, it's really funny, like you said, you know, what do I collect next? I, I did a, I mean, this is before YouTube was a big thing. I, I did an article for decktech.net, and then I put it up on my blog about, all right, I've collected all Black Border Premiere or, or Black Border Star Wars. What's next? Okay, you got the White Border sets. You got Japanese. You've got, you know, promos. You've got the posters. You've got, you know, Reflections Gold. And so I, I went over this kind of like step by step of where do collectors go here from here to here to here. You know, and I did that. I mean, this was like 2010, 12, something like that, that I wrote this article. So it's really funny to like see you guys now collecting and, and talking about this much more in these videos and be like, 
hey, this is the process we went through. And I'm like, yeah, it's step by step of what I wrote out before. And now grading's a whole different level that wasn't even there, you know, for this game when I was writing that article. So it's it's really fascinating to see, you know, you're you're providing a lot of the same information just in an updated format, you know, and I, I think it's great, Matt. You're doing a great job. You're doing you're doing the gamers work here. <laughs> you know, I, I think we all appreciate it, you know, from a, a collectors and a, a fun standpoint and people that just enjoy it. You know, I I don't play as much, you know, I, I attended Worlds for the last time. I want to say it was like 20, oh gosh, I can't even remember. It was in Philadelphia. It was when um, Kessel Mining was popular and uh, <laughs> Jedi Night Club is before the current reset that's like in place now. So I mean, that tells you how long ago it was. I played Taco Bell first round. It was a five minute game. We got done super fast and we just sat there like, well, what do we do for the next 55 minutes? You know, like it was really funny. Like it was a great time. And I miss that. Like you said, that, that camaraderie and doing, I mean, if you can go to world events, if you go to Gen Con, if you can go to any of these events where you can meet with like the people that love your hobbies with you, I mean, it's so much fun. It's great to get to know these players. I mean, I met like at that Philadelphia event, I hung out with Brian Fred. I hung out with, Greg Hoder, you know, I've got these two massive dudes with me. We went and got Philly cheesesteaks, you know, <laughs> it was the best time. You know, I was like, I've never been to Philly before. This is so much fun. Hoder's from there, you know, meeting these guys that you talk to on the board. Do you talk to like on Skype, yeah. like, you know, or, you know, through a video service or, you know, you're playing on, on GIMP when you actually meet them in person, it's so much fun. You know, uh, Casey and niece, like uh, Michael Pistone, like all these guys, you know, uh, Scott Lingro, like all these guys that are great guys that you you see talk on the boards and you see on Facebook, when you get to meet them and have that synergy and that connection is so much fun. So. Yeah, and, and the one thing I'll say as well is there, there's something to be said about the more obscure your hobby it is, the, the more joy you find in finding that camaraderie, right? Yeah. L like I, I don't do any magic stuff. I play magic with friends, but I don't talk about it on the channel. I might, you know, maybe someday I will, but no one wants to hear about that because everybody's talking about it, right? Yeah. Like you just need to go to the local game store and you can find some people that want to play magic, right? Like that's yeah, not yeah. that interesting, but there's something to be said about like, we're getting into meta stuff here, but it's like a collecting, you know, like you, you collect, but you also need to like find the collectors. So you're kind of like collecting collectors almost, right? Yeah, like, yeah. Because this stuff is, is like kind of obscure and that's okay, but it also feels kind of grassroots, which feels a little rewarding you know, like finding that community, it's like, oh, another person. Cool. Right. Like we all, we like the same stuff. So I, I find that to be really fun. One of my, uh, this is one of my controversial hot takes is new formats for Star Wars. I, I think we, 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 in the last couple of minutes here, right, we're hitting the hour mark, but I would love a commander version of Star Wars. Yes. Right. Like why not? I mean, this is all you can do this outside the PC, but just like new and different formats rather than 60 cards, whether it's 50 cards, 100 cards. I, I, the thing about Star Wars is since it's so long, right? But 100 cards, you could do some stuff like actually get Star Destroyers out and, you know, all, all sorts of things that might be interesting. Um, but anyways, I, I would just like to see a bit more like, you know, you had an idea from that, that stopped evolving in 2001. And I think the PC's done a really good job with new cards and keeping the meta fresh. But what about just radically rethinking this as well? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's that's my closing uh, closing remarks. So here's a here's a final thought for you. So 2005 ish, I want to say 2008. I can't remember. We did a Las Vegas Invitational event where we had Michael Arisman was there. I think Brian Fred. Uh, uh, oh gosh, uh, there's a bunch of good players there. Uh, who Brian Hunter was there. I mean, mm -hmm. it was a really fun event. I played Imperial Class Star Destroyer deck uh, built around Set Your Course for Alderaan. I had 12 foil Imperial Class Star Destroyers in the deck that I played <laughs> with, guys. I played with 12 foil Imperial Class Star Destroyers. I can't believe that when they're going for so much money now and people are getting upgraded. I'm like, holy smokes, I had 12 of those at one time. I have none now. I haven't seen one in for years. But I, I, that, that card I is like... The deck. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. That 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 is like the 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 just like the the, the ultimate chase card now. I think. Yeah. I, I feel like there's some guy that just has a basement full of them or something because <laughs> something doesn't match up with the supply and demand. But that's we can save our conspiracy theories for another day. I'll tell you right now. I bought collections from former <laughs> Decipher employees. I I bought uh, Lord of the Rings collection and he had 300 of the Black Rider foils and 300 of the Aramur foils that were like the promos, right? 
And so I'm like, yeah, there's some Decipher employee that's just sitting on stock of crap, uh, you know, that that's ready to burst at any time. Who knows? So I'll just say, because, <laughs> uh, you know, Decipher is based in Norfolk and I'm, I'm, I'm in D.C. So I'm always yeah. quietly like, hey, you know, the employees were kind of based within an hour of me. Like, you know, yeah. have the state sales that, yeah. you know, like that sort of stuff that might have like the the the, the ultimate payload there. But. Ken, Kendrick Summers that used to work for Decipher, he used to have the most amazing stuff that he would sell. And it, like I was lucky enough to buy a lot of that from him. Oh, man, it was beautiful right off the printer, like not even put into packs. I mean, it was just beautiful stuff. Anyways, it's it's amazing to me because I, I don't know where all these guys went. Like you see a couple of them on the boards, but I, I guess Decipher had, you know, I, I think close to a thousand employees between all the different like product lines. And I just don't really see those people like kind of hanging out and talking about stuff. I mean, maybe I don't want to talk about a job I did 20 years ago, but <laughs> it, it just seems like um, they, they would kind of be around or like the Decipher execs. I, I don't know what where Warren Holland is hiding, um, but, you know, somewhere, I think within an hour of me, maybe, <laughs> you know, somewhere in that like an hour radius. Yeah. But, um, anyway, Scott, this has been a lot of fun. Um, we're going to definitely have to have you on again sometime soon. Um, but this is great and, uh, we'll be sure like, and subscribe for the 1% of <laughs> people that are still here, you know, et cetera. We'll, we'll see you guys next time. Thanks, Matt. Have a good one, everybody.